Hello, my name is Sue and I work for the Youth and Community Development Team at Northern Beaches Council. Welcome to our third webinar in a Safe and Sound Wellbeing series. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge all of those with a personal experience of suicide or mental ill health, as well as families, friends, carers and support services who help us all to live well. The Safe and Sound webinar series features six free wellbeing webinars aimed at young people, those who support young people, men, women, LGBTI, QA plus communities and seniors. In each webinar you'll hear from a range of local experts sharing information on key stresses, how to support others and how to access local support services. So whether it's fit to help you or those around you, we hope everyone attending this webinar today or watching on demand in the future will get something positive out of coming along. These webinars have been made possible thanks to grant funding from the New South Wales Ministry of Health. So today's webinar is finding your way to wellness as a young person. And we have four great speakers lined up for you. We have Kerry from CCMB. We have Belinda from SDEC. We have Louise and Godleaf from Good Grief. And we have Kylie from Relationships Australia. Um, Mike and I are here at Glen Street Theatre. And Mike is actually helping us facilitate all of the webinars. So over to you, Mike. Thank you, Sue. Nice to see you all. So, Thank you everybody for joining us for this webinar. So a few bits of housekeeping before we begin. So when you enter the webinar, you'll notice that your microphones are muted and you um, have no access to the camera. Um, when you observe, you'll notice that people are, you'll only see one presenter at a time, so there'll be no slides at all. Um, and questions can be asked for the Q&A um, using the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. So. We realise sometimes when speaking about mental health, the people with lived experience of this or who are currently feeling vulnerable may find themselves impacted by the material. If this is the case for you, we recommend that you reach out and you get support um, by a friend or a family member or even from an organisation such as Lifeline should you need that. So we're going to go through and uh, speak to each of our four presenters tonight. They'll each speak for about 10 minutes each and then at the end um, of the webinar, we'll do a Q&A session where we'll get to some of those questions that you've submitted throughout. So, Sue. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Okay, well, to our first speaker. Um, welcome to Kerry from CCMB. Kerry, I was just wondering if you could give us a really quick overview of who CCMB is, and in particular, a bit more about the Seasons Programme. Oh, you there, Kerry? If you un unmute your, your microphone. <laughs> How are you going? Thanks, Sue. Yay! Hi, thank you. Um, so CCMB is Community Care Northern Beaches. It's a not-for-profit community organisation uh, providing impartial information, advice and guidance. We assist community members with navigating the health and social care system. We've got very, uh, quite a few services within CCMB, but the one I'm going to focus on tonight is the Seasons Programme. The Seasons Programme is for anyone that's had a suicide attempt. We coordinate a wraparound service of support with um, a holistic approach. It's a short-term programme funded by the Primary Health Network, and the aim is to ensure safety and prevention of a re-attempt of suicide whilst linking into informal and formal supports. That's great. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, I was wondering, how do people access your service? So referrals can be received by anybody through our website, which is www.ccmb.com.au, or you can call us directly on our Seasons program, which is 1300 000 125. That's great. Thank you, Kerry. And when a young person does come to your service, what, are, what is the range of supports that you would usually provide to them? So the main thing we do is assisting them with a goal plan to identify their needs for their recovery journey. And that's assisting also with safety planning to ensure that they're safe offering information, advice and guidance, um, linking into appropriate tailored supports tailored for their own needs. Um, the main thing we always ensure that they have got is a regular GP 
uh, having that relationship with a GP for the wraparound support service is essential to their well-being. Linking them to appropriate psychologists or counsellors if that's what they require. Uh, we work in collaboration with other necessary services involved to enhance the wraparound supports. Um, and yet, as I mentioned, linking into informal supports such as CCMB companions, um, art therapy, mindfulness, group supports, helping with housing if there's homeless issues um, and if necessary, returning to education or helping them find appropriate jobs if that's what they'd like in their goals. That's wonderful. Thanks, Kerry. And obviously young people can reach out to your service, but do you also support other people that might have questions about people that they are supporting as well? Yeah, of course. So that's that's our thing at CCMB is supporting, um, you know, the person themselves, but also supporting family members. Um, so, yeah, we're more than happy to to support whoever needs any advice or guidance. Yeah, thanks, Kerry. Um, so I was wondering whether you had any key messages of hope that perhaps you could give to um, any of the people tuning in tonight that are actually supporting young people? Yeah, I would say um, a big one is letting young people know that they're not a burden um, and that they're not alone. Having the conversation, which I know some people struggle with, they feel that if they do ask if they're struggling or if they're feeling suicidal, that, you know, it could make that happen, which is a myth. I think really having the conversation is imperative, asking directly if they're okay, um, if they're struggling or if they're thinking about suicide. And if they are, then helping them seek that help. Um, letting them know that taking their life is not an option and the feeling will pass. Um, and connecting them maybe with people with a, a similar experience so they're not feeling so isolated and alone and acknowledging them, you know, allowing them to feel valid or heard in, in how they're feeling in that moment. Yeah, all very valuable messages. Thanks, Kerry. And mm. I think a lot of those themes kind of have came out recently in the Better Off With You campaign that say in Australia um, was promoting across the northern beaches as well, that issue of you're not a burden and you're not alone and to reach out. So um, thanks, Kerry. Really appreciate all your, your words. And um, you. yeah, we might just move to the next speaker. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Sue. And thanks, Kerry, for sharing that. You know, we know from the research that um, young people who feel like they're a burden are at that higher risk of suicide. So being able to let them know it's okay to talk and being able to have those direct conversations, you know, particularly around safety, around suicide. Um, the research and the experience certainly of Lifeline shows that those direct conversations are really critical and it's often a real relief for people to talk about their experience. And so really important we can facilitate those conversations and, and give people a chance to talk about what's happening mm. for them. You know, it's, it's such a, makes such a difference for people when they can share that stress and, and what they're going through, Sue. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So thank you, Belinda. Um, oh, thank you, Kerry, sorry. Our thank next you. People, yeah, good to see you. Our next presenters are Louise and Godalee from Good Grief. So really nice to have you both with us. Um, can you both please touch on what your service offers those who are supporting young people? whether that be parents, carers, teachers, or mentors? Yes, uh, thanks for having us here. Um, yes, we at Good Grief, we train teachers and health professionals in a program, and that's called Seasons for Growth. And Seasons for, for Growth is a program, an eight-week program for children and young people um, in aged between 6 and 18. There's four different levels. Um, and it helps children and young people to deal with any big changes, losses, and grief in their lives. The program, the type of program, children and young people learn how to adapt to changes they experience. And that can be um, bereavement, it can be the, the death of a loved one, but it can also be changes in the family situation due to separation and divorce, and the birth of new sibling. Uh, moving houses and things like that. So it's a small work program, as I said, it runs over eight weeks, and we use the seasons as a reservoir for change. And children learn to accept the changes part of life. They learn how to recognize and validate the feelings experienced in um, association with the change and the loss. And we learn healthy ways of coping with those big feelings. 
And in the summer season, they be looking to exploring how to move forward um, after that change. So basically, it is a program which really enhances the social and emotional well-being um, and resilience. As I mentioned, we train professionals in the programs. We recently trained uh, several teachers on the northern beaches uh, and health professionals in children's and young people program and also in the parent program. So there's also a parent program where parents can learn how to support their children after separation or or bereavement. So that's sort of work we offer. Thanks, Godalev. So. Sorry, the audio for me was a little faint there. I'm hoping that our, our listeners can hear it okay. Um, so can you tell us a bit about the range of significant life events that may trigger experiences of change, loss and grief in young people? So we, we work with children and young people who've had a variety of changes. It could be any significant event that's occurred. So as God believes that, that could be of a family member or a close or Other significant life events like So any kind of event change for them either individually or within their family or within their um, school or their community. We talk a lot um, with children around the different changes and the impact of them, which would be very different for each person and often cumulative. So we know that when there's a change in a family, for example, that might also be impacting their parents and lead to changes within their relationships as well. Um, and also we talk a lot about those second belongings. So people can recognise that bereavement is definitely um, a grief and loss experience, but they might not have thought about Thanks, Louise. I'm just going to I'm just going to jump in there. I think we're having a few audio challenges, so we might move to our next um, presenter, and we'll come back to you when we've had a chance to look at that and, and get that audio sorted. I'm so sorry about that, Louise and Godleaf. Um, so we'll we'll come back to you soon because I know I think we struggle to sort of hear um, some of the the answers to those questions. So. Kylie, we, it's your turn now. We're coming to you. So this is Kylie from Relationships Australia. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I was Thanks wondering if me. you could tell us a little bit about the work that Relationships Australia does. Well, we, Relationships Australia has centres all over New South Wales. And um, right here in the Northern Beaches, we have one at DY. Um, we offer family counselling and individual and couples counselling. And we are at the moment, we are doing it online, but we hope to be back face to face in the office because especially with young people, I think it's really important to have them face to face. And we also run groups. We've got a free group for um, parents of teenagers called Tuning Into Teens, which um, was on at the beginning of the year. And that's about how to emotionally understand your, your young person's um, what they're going through, how to listen to them, how to tune in and respect them. We also have um, a particular whole service for um, children who are having difficulties uh, with, in their family between the ages of 10 and 21 called RAPS and um, that's something that services the whole of Sydney. That's great. Thank you so much, Kylie. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the different types of relationships that young people uh, can experience and the importance of healthy relationships for young people? I think a good healthy relationship is, is fundamental to their well-being and having um, a secure um, relationship with a parent is, is very important or some sort of um, main adult in their life. But as, as young people grow from a child into an adult, they start to draw away from their family and their peers become far more important. And so um, one minute you're having a child who's underfoot and next minute they're out the door. And this is a time where they actually still need their parents just as much as ever, but there's not much opportunity to be there. So a good healthy relationship is one where um, you can listen to your child with respect and understanding and, and sort of gently negotiate the different um, rules and expectations as they change because um, children from teenagers getting into young adulthoods change so quickly. 
Um, so they have, their peer groups are very important. And then as they get into the later teens, then their one-on-one -on -one relationships and their romantic relationships can become very important to a stage where it might seem like obsession, but it's always good to have the family around them, um, no matter what that family constellation looks like. No, fair point. Um, having a couple of teenagers of my own in the house, I understand that transition is a, a tricky one sometimes. Um, so I, I was going to um, just touch on that we know um, from, um, from comments from Lifeline Northern Beaches that there are many people who are accessing services for counselling. Um, they're often seeking help for managing relationships with family members. I wondered if you could touch on some of the key stresses that parents could experience when it comes to relationships within a family setting. Well, um, a child turning into a teenager and into a young adult, their brain is going through the biggest transformation um, that we have. It's when it's pruning away um, and doing lots of changes. I won't go into the, the neuroscience of it, but it's that time where they might be quite irrational, obedient, sort of 10 year old and then by the time they're 11 or 12 they might not be able to communicate communicate at all they might be stomping through the door and by the time they're 13 the same until you get uh, some semblance of communication back around the age of 15 but during this time the main tension that comes up I think is a lack of understanding that parents might have of these changes and a shock when it happens so suddenly and when the emotions are all pouring out and so to actually for a parent to um, be more sort of present within themselves and calm and create a space where they can listen to their young, um, young adult or young teenage child um, and to just hear them and to not try and do things like say snap out of it or cheer up or it's not so bad because for a young person's brain they can um, get into almost obsessions about things which is a really an emotional place and it's a really big thing for them and I think a lot of the conflicts is just parents not really understanding um, about that and um, yeah sometimes coming to counselling to help them sort of uh, recognise that and to listen and have some space is very good. Yeah, great advice. Thank you, Kylie. And um, certainly when you mentioned tuning into teens, that's a great um, program that parents can link into. And there's a few other services, including Relationships Australia, that offer that on the northern beaches, I know. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us how people can access your service um, and perhaps also tease out sort of how um, you would assist someone who might be struggling with difficult family dy dynamics at this time? Yes, um, well, they can access us by looking at our, our website for our phone number. Um, if you want to write it down, it's 1300 364 277, but I know that there'll be links sent out at the end of this. And you just can um, make an appointment for um, the whole family to come in, or it might just be initially maybe one parent or both parents coming in first and then we'll talk if it's a young person we'll talk to them individually but ideally we like to see um, members of the family together and what we do is create a safe space where everybody can hear each other and the council will facilitate that conversation so there becomes a common understanding about issues and sometimes people just don't have the time or the safety to do that in, in their own home because there's, you know, not really setting it up and to have somebody to help negotiate and then to find a, a common pattern of what the problem is between people because it's often not one person's issue. You know, it's not that the young person who's got the problem or the, or the parent or the sibling. It's a whole combination and it could be other people in the community too um, causing that. But to recognise the pattern of interaction and then... Um, to allow people to come up with their own solutions of what they can do individually to change their part, their, their part in the, in the pattern of, of, of the problem and how to change it and to shift it around. And so we find family therapy sitting down all together is um, really helpful. That's great. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, clearly the dynamic... Yes, go for it. I just want to add one thing. Of course. There, there are times, of course, where there's 
such a big breakdown in, in the relationship. And that's when we're not going to always say that young people have to come in with their family or vice versa. We do encourage it that we might spend quite a bit of time just with the young person to hear their side of things um, as well. So we also offer, you know, individual counselling with the older um, teens and young adults. Great. Thank you so much, Carly. That's important that they have a voice um, in that whole process as well. And it, I think it really touches on that real, the, com the complex nature of a family system that, you know, you're obviously trying to tease out and support in that environment. So thank you for the work you do. Um, right. Uh, over to you, Mike. Thanks, Sue. Yeah. And something that, uh, you know, we were speaking about just then with Carly, you know, the idea that we young people, their changes are so rapid and they're really caught up in their perspective. So to be able to listen to understand them, create a space for them to share their experience and be curious about what it's like for them. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's easy for us to judge it from our level of experience. You know, we've been through that, it's not a big deal. But when you're in it, mm -hmm. it can be really huge and overwhelming. So having that space to talk and, and, and really listen um, to their experience can be really important. So thanks so much, Carly. So we might go to Belinda now from ESTEC. So welcome, Belinda. Um, can you tell us a little bit about ESTEC and what you're about? Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, yeah, ESTEC is Sydney Drug Education and Counselling Centre. That's why it's called ESTEC. It's a bit of a mouthful. Some of you may remember us as Manly Drug Education and Counselling Centre before we had a name change. And we changed the name because we cover the whole of the Northern Sydney area and we have two offices, one based in Manly, and one based in St. Leonard's. Um, we currently are, we are a specialist service. So we work with young people and parents that um, have um, alcohol or other drug issues and usually and most commonly co-occurring mental health issues. Um, so the service actually is an intensive um, therapeutic um, support for young people. Um, we're very aware that young people do not quite often um, and, we, and we, we work with parents around that but we also offer a very intensive six-week supportive program for parents um, because by the time sometimes we're working with families and, and as Kylie we really rightly said there's times where breakdown has happened quite significantly when there's drug and alcohol put on top of the family system with everything else involved um, there's usually a really strong heightened level of distress um, from parents and family members, understandably. Um, and so we provide intensive support for those parents. We also do um, a lot of training, education and consultancy um, as we're considered a, um, a centre of excellence. And we're very fortunate to be based on the Northern Beaches where we don't really have much of an equivalent anywhere else. 12 to 25 is our age range for young people. Um, and parents of those people. So if one is presenting, or for example, parents present and the young person is not coming, that's fine too. Mm, great, thanks Belinda. Um, great that we have a manly based organisation. Obviously you've now expanded, but really nice to have you here local on the Northern Beaches. Can you tell us a bit about some of the underlying issues for those young people who might present to your service? Yeah, oh, look, absolutely. And you know, when I when I when I ponder this question, it's it's that classic thing that when drugs and alcohol come into the case, one of the things that people often do is have a heightened sense of distress and, and concern for understandable reasons. I think one of the most important things that we see for young people, and people always want to um, really hang things on addiction for being a reason, use words like addiction and worry about those kind of ideas. Um, of that they're just kind of chemically hijacked because they've taken this drug and then therefore that, that's kind of the, the end result. So nothing was wrong, took drugs, problem. And, and it's really, really so incredibly not simple. Um, what we do see though is high levels of, of young people who often have co-occurring issues, um, whether it be depression, anxiety. Obviously we work with young people who may be pot potentially developing a psychotic illness and may have um, experiences of where they've had drug use that has triggered a particular episode. We know that young people, as you were saying before, because they're in this incredible stage of development and it's normal to be secretive from parents, um, it is very common for them to rely on their peers and their peer-based group um, for actually um, finding out their information and support, just as similar to parents actually often get their information through media 
and, and other types of social networking. So what we see is, to me, the, the big issue that we look at for families generally and looking at families as a whole, whether they present separately, is that it's always the result of a perfect storm. So you'll have a variety of mechanisms. You'll have things around. So the, so the really the drug use and the dependence, which does require a subspecialty in mental health really, does require people to understand the language and, and the way to work with those specific issues. But more importantly, that we look at the drug and alcohol issues more of symptoms um, often of issues as opposed to causal factors. Um, a lot of people will start using drugs and why they start using, stay using and stop using will be all very different reasons. So I think the most important thing is to remember that it's complex, but that the majority of young people do grow out of things, um, but it can be a very difficult time for families um, when they're in that space where they're not speaking, they're using drugs, they're out with their friends, their behaviour changes, and they're kind of just focusing on the drug use. So we like to remind people there can be a lot of other things going on for people at that time. Yeah, thanks, Belinda. Really important to recognise the complexity of that and to look beyond the surface of those presentations to what might be underlying it, particularly, you know, where that support may be breaking down, where that, where that young person may be struggling um, or impacted by other things going on in their life and to have that curiosity about what else is going on behind the scenes is really critical. So for those, those who do care for young people, um, what advice would you give them in terms of alcohol and other drugs? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And one of the things I love that you're saying tonight, Mike, is about that concept of being curious. Um, it is really hard. I, you know, working in the drug and alcohol industry for a long time, um, if you think stigma is attached to mental health, um, drug and alcohol is about 50 years behind that. So one of the great inventors and barriers for young people in relation to treatment and also talking about things to their family is the stigmatisation around those issues. So what we we hear drug use and it's and we're like haven't you listened to the conversations and why would you do that um, and we can stop being curious as to why we can focus the pathology on what why are you doing that instead of so instead of what's wrong with you what's happening for you sometimes it's just curiosity and that's it I have had young people even say I just wanted to know what I was saying no to um, which is a kind of a, an understandable thing for a young person to say, but that curiosity is often a common thing. Young people also often seek out drug use too in, in, in an interesting way of, of some of the acting out behaviour we can see. And when people talk about the peer group that Kylie said, which I really want to mention, is such an important part of their world and everything. When we tell them it's your friends that are the problem, it is actually just someone else's young person talking about um, and generally their credibility within each other. The biggest thing that I would love people to know, I could do, and everyone knows I can talk a lot, I could talk to you for a week about cannabis and it will not change. Information does not equate change in behaviour. It's important, but it doesn't change it. What does have a problem in having the conversations is the high levels of stigmatisation. So for example, if we didn't have changes around mental health language as we have had, fortunately, in our time, where we're talking about things that were highly stigmatised before. Imagine if we were saying to a young person, well, if you weren't a bong head, you'd be better off. It's like saying, well, you're just a sad sack and a big wet blanket, and that's your problem. So what we tend to do is, we're, and we're all guilty of this, as a sector, we've had to change the way we speak. Um, people often refer to anyone using drugs as junkies, and really kind of, and don't do that, you'll be a junkie and you'll be that person. That is actually probably one of the most things that put them on the back foot. So if people are actually engaging in drug use, it's kind of insulting their choice. That you could absolutely say to them that you can be clear about what you want in your home and what you want for them. But my most important thing is to not get engaged in those arguments about whether you think something should be illegal or not by constantly telling them that they're under construction. If you do that to your brain, you'll be brain damaged because then they think, well, I might as well just keep going. Um, we really want to start those things around, what is it about that that is, is important for you? You know, I'm not, I'm not okay with it, but tell me, help me understand why and, and have that curiosity. So it's the stigma that if I had a magic wand and we had no stigma around mental health and AOD, I can't imagine how easier um, the world would be for everybody.
Yeah, beautifully said, Belinda, and I think there's something really important in what you say about how the stigma can be a barrier for people getting support and how it can block people from actually supporting people who are struggling with alcohol or other drugs. And it's really important to recognise the importance of, of the difference between pathologising an individual and saying there's something wrong with them, we're looking at, rather than looking at our society and how we're structuring our society to create a space for people to be who they need to be um, and creating room for them to explore their experience and their identity. So I think there's a really key issues that you're tapping into. And again, moving back to that idea of how can we be curious, what's their experience like, what has happened for them, what has led them to this point where the drugs or alcohol are helping give them some relief for, around their experience. I think there's a really important points that you're raising. Belinda, and just one, sorry, on. I was just going to say one more thing about that with the stigma is actually about we have a real adult credibility crisis. We really do. And so it's, it's more about because we get our information from shockumentaries and and, and kind of these stigmatising media channels that really highlight an intense fear in parents and don't necessarily to young people. The credibility of our information is so important. If you say something like, you smoke cannabis and it gives you schizophrenia, they will prove you wrong and then you lose your credibility. The lack of credibility that we have around drug and alcohol, I have never seen it more as I have now. And that is a really, really important thing. I hear myths and misinformation come out of people's mouths, not because of intentions, but because they literally have this strong conviction that, that information is correct. And a lot of the times it absolutely is not. Hmm. Good point. And as you said before, if you're doing that, you're really focusing on the symptom rather than the underlying issues anyway. And so it would be a much better focus to be talking to that young person, finding out what's really happening for them, rather than trying to scare them away from, from the behaviours that are actually supporting them at this time through probably what's a really overwhelming experience for them. So finally, Belinda, can you let us know how someone might access your service at SDEC? Yes, absolutely. It's always a bit of a scary question. It's been a bit of an unprecedented time for service. And I know we're all under the pump, but we absolutely want to encourage people that um, to reach out. So there's a variety of ways people come to our service through just direct self-referral. Um, if you see SDEC in my little box in the corner there, you can also just put .org.au after it just to get our website and our phone numbers. They can ring up. If it's a young person and they're under 15, we have to have parental um, consent and discussion around that with them. Um, it is really confidential, so it's really important that um, parents know that we're not there to, to, to tell them about all the, the drugs their child may or may not be using, um, but what we do is encourage the families to come in. So if anyone rings, if parents ring because they want to force their child in, then give us a ring so we can talk to you about that and we can support you in a way to let them do that. So direct phone call and we also work very collaboratively with a lot of these other amazing services and a lot of the other youth services. Um, and we also have a partnership, we're on the consortium for Headspace. So if your young person or anyone goes to Headspace for an assessment and there is an issue that is more specific to our, suitable for our service, then they will directly refer them into us. Lovely. Thank you, Belinda. Thanks so much for sharing that all with us tonight. Just a reminder for you all that the Q&A um, we'll get to shortly. If you want to submit a question, you can do so with the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. So we're going to return now to Louise and got to leave from Good Grief, who we had some technical issues with before. Hopefully we're back in business now. So Louise and got to leave, can you share us, just give us a brief synopsis of your service and what you offer? <laughs> Okay, I'll just be um, a little bit shorter than I was before to take some time, but we train um, teachers and health professionals in the four seasons for growth, and that program is for children and young people between 6 and 18. We have different levels. It's mostly rolled out in schools, and it helps children um, be stealing, be adapting to big changes in their lives. And it can be after a change in family circumstances, it can be after losses, it can be after the death of a loved one. So any big changes in a young person's life uh, causes loss and grief responses. And through this program, 
which is a small group program for four to seven um, children in one group. Over eight weeks, they learn um, what change means, how change is often a constant in life, and what kind of feelings and, uh, and emotions are associated with those changes. So children start to um, become more aware of their feelings and emotions, and we help them to explore coping strategies to deal with that change and loss in their lives. So we recently trained um, a whole group of teachers on the Northern Beaches and health professionals in our programs. So if you're interested in these programs, um, the best way to start is to check in with your school, whether it wants, uh, and also some community service offer the program. Great, thanks Godlieve for sharing that. So what are some of the uh, range of significant life events that may trigger experiences of change, loss or grief for young people? So as God we've started to say, it could be around the bereavement, that's what people often think when we talk about grief and loss, um, but it could equally be any other kind of change as well. So it could be family separation. A lot of the children that come to our programme would have had um, experience of family separation. It could be relocation, um, a new sibling being born, maybe friendship issues. It could be transition to a new school, so um, going from year six to year seven or moving through the uh, teenage years and coming out of school and that change. Um, one of the things that happens a lot for children is they have a major event in their life or um, something that's a, a major change for them and that also impacts the rest of their family or their community. So if there's family separation, for example, there could then be a number of secondary losses like moving the house, maybe joining a blended family, um, maybe you don't live with your pet anymore that was one of your best supports. Um, changes within family dynamics and relationships. So the big thing for us really is to support people to look through that lens of grief and loss so that you can see maybe some of the things that your um, child may have experienced that you have thought of in that way. And as God we've said, the programme then supports that. And we also look a lot at those cumulative losses. So um, where children have maybe had that constant change, as God we've said. So for a lot of children, if we actually think about this, we may be able to identify that they've had a lot of change, but we haven't necessarily kind of really seen it um, in terms of grief and loss before. Mm. I mean, change, like Holly was saying before, change is such a fundamental experience, isn't it, for young people? The brain's changing at the rapid rate. There's so much changing in their life experience in terms of how they're perceiving the world and how they're, you know, exploring. Um, different experiences so that's already part of their life experience and then of course you add in all of the real world changes that can happen like you just described um, and things can become really challenging and really confronting so in terms of supporting a young person who's dealing with change grief or loss what are some tips that you both can offer I guess first of all to acknowledge that change is very difficult and that any change in your life can take a long time to accept the reality of that change. Um, often as adults we look at children's changes and we feel that they will get over it quite quickly or they will be okay. But often for children that, that process change can trigger a whole range of feelings and emotions. So I think as a parent and carer to be really aware of what that change means for that child by stepping into their shoes and again being curious about what is going on for them on that emotional level. So it is about having conversations about what that change may mean for them and validating all the feelings associated with that change. And this is what we do in the program with the children as well. And often children are really relieved to hear that it is okay to be angry or to be frustrated or to be sad about the things that happen to them. So acknowledging and accepting and validating those feelings is really helpful to, to do that as a parent and carer. Um, and talking about feelings, helping them to name feelings so they can use their language rather than actions. Um, and also exploring with your child what helps them to move through those big feelings as sadness and anger. We come from a place that we really believe that children are very capable um, and that they often have the answers available. We tend to problem solve very quickly. We want to 
you know, see our children happy and cheerful. So then there is those big feelings we often tend to distract. And actually by sitting with that feeling with your child and acknowledging that feeling and then exploring together what would help them to move through that feeling can be really empowering for children. Yeah, thank you so much. It's such a, an important thing is that we shut down emotions at our peril. You know, it's a really dangerous thing to do. Um, it leads to all kinds of problems. And so to be able to support families and support relationships where people can really sit with a young person and really encourage them to feel into that emotion, to share that emotion, to engage with that emotion, it's such a, a critical part of supporting somebody. Um, and I really love the normalisation of that that we're hearing, Sue, you know, and the curiosity that we're hearing tonight about how we need to be hearing what their experience is like. You know, it can be easy to sit in the role of expert, as I've been there and done that, and this is what you should be doing, but to be really asking them their opinion and allowing their experience, really giving them permission to be where they are, I think it's such a key thing, and, and you've outlined that really beautifully from, from Good Grief. So thank you both for sharing that with us. It's been really lovely to have you both on. Sorry for some of the audio challenges we've had, but uh, certainly I could hear um, a good piece of that. I hope our listeners could as well. Let's see, we're going to go Great. to some Yes, we, we finished our presentation for all of our speakers tonight. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we've got some questions that come in, and um, I might throw the first one to Kerry. So, Kerry, this first question is, how has COVID changed the nature of issues that young people and families are bringing to your service? Um, there's a second part to the question as well, which says, how have the numbers seeking help and support changed significantly as well due to COVID? So has COVID changed the nature of issues that people are presenting with? And what are the numbers like for you? Oh, you might just need to unmute. Sorry, Kerry, just unmute your mic. All good? Thanks, sorry, Sue. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, our numbers have significantly increased. Um, and that's been a result of alcohol and drug increase um, and loneliness and loss of job and financial issues has been a, um, an increase in suicide attempts on the Northern Beaches. Mm. And the, the nature, so generally you're seeing more people present because of drug and alcohol and financial stress. That seems to be a bit of a theme um, that yeah. we've seen through the rest of our webinars, I think, too. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, financial issues and, and loss of job and, and loneliness. You know, people yeah. struggling with not having that social connection or contact and, you know, having to stay at, at home. I think that was one of the key themes that's come through a lot of our webinars so far, actually, Mike, that real, um, when we've asked presenters what can we do in terms of responding to some of the challenges, it is about reaching out and connection. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I think that's definitely a common theme. Um, so thank you very much, Kerry, for that. Thank you. Um, and I might even ask Kylie the same question from Relationships Australia. I just wondered whether your service had seen that change in terms of presentations because of COVID for young people and families and whether you have seen an increase in numbers. Um, yes, Sue, we have. And I think it's um, very common as with teenagers that as they want to become more independent, that parents think that they should be on their own, but it's actually a time when they need more connection than ever. So independence doesn't mean isolation. And what everybody's been saying here today about creating a space, validating feelings, being curious, just being there without being intrusive or pushy or putting your opinions onto your, the young person in your family is so important um, to keep that connection up. In the time of COVID, a lot of young people have gone towards social media and, and as we know, sometimes that can um, not contribute to happiness, but more to depression as they see what their other people have put up there and feel even more sort of lonely that they can't interact. Um, and there's also been a lot of fear 
after, after doing a lot of homeschooling about going back to school or TAFE or work or uni. Um, for children and young people who feel more anxious that um, they'll go out there and, and they have to be judged again. And so some people, are, are, some young people just want to stay in their rooms. That transition's really hard for them. Thank you, Kylie. Um, really great summary in terms of some of those complexities that, that a young person might experience. Some might be really happy to get back to school for that social connection, others not so. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. Yeah, and the challenges of that transition back after the yeah. period of time, as Kylie was saying, Sue, you know, you, you've, you've had that period in isolation, you might be social mediaing, but it's a very different thing to talk to a person face to face. It's a different mm -hmm. thing that happens in our bodies when we, when we meet someone face to face. So that transition, being aware of the potential challenges of that, I think is really Absolutely. important. Absolutely. And I might just give a pl big um, plug for the Big Ideas Forum that's coming up, the Council's running, which is going to touch on COVID and that sort of that change that we might be experiencing and what happens next. So that's coming up next from a council's event perspective. Yeah, and we, mm -hmm. we spoke before about that theme of, of isolation and disconnection, how dangerous that is. You know, um, we were talking with Belinda before about alcohol and other drugs. You know, there's a saying that the opposite of addiction is connection. Um, and obviously, you know, as we've said before in this webinar, humans really suffer in isolation. We really struggle, you know, there's something um, critical to our well-being to be connected, to mm -hmm. be in supportive relationships. And this is a really important thing that we have to keep returning to, to remind ourselves that we need this for our health, we need this for our well-being, we need to be connected. So we've got some great questions pouring in, so I better not get too sidetracked. <laughs> I have one for you, Belinda. Um, we have a question about what the impact might be if someone has a sibling taking drugs, how likely is that to affect um, other siblings in terms of drug use and, and their likelihood of using drugs or alcohol? That's a really good question. Um, I think like, uh, you know, I, I always love to, to pigeonhole too much for the simple fact that we tend to simplify the complexities all the time. And the best way for me to answer that is, um, is to really say, we, we don't know. Some can overcompensate and think, well, you've wrecked mum and dad's life and be really angry and we have a lot of sibling issues as well that go on or, or others actually follow suit. You know, families have their own mini cultures and, and they really are to be respected as little independent kind of cultures as well. And nobody is causal around drug and alcohol, but we can unknowingly contribute sometimes to the trajectories and the changes um, of young people. So if you have had a, a younger person that's had um, drug and alcohol, if they've had issues, that can have a very different impact to experimentation. It is not uncommon for siblings to introduce siblings to drugs or alcohol, by the way, which is still the biggest killer of young people, I might add, but, but it's not always a done deal, and, and, but it can be like that. And that's because also we see that young people seem to cross peer ages and group, peer groups, they mix at all different ages more so now than they used to. So there's, there's often that introduction, but it, it really is, we don't know because people only make sense when we have the right information as, as, as workers to help them navigate those complexities in the first place. So no, mm. no that's great. And I might ask you a follow up question. Um, mm. If you're supporting a young person, how, helpful is it to share your own experiences of taking drugs or, or using alcohol? Uh, generally not very. Um, so generally not very. And, and I think there's been, because the industry that I work on has been based in morality and the disease model of, of addiction. And when I say that, there's a lot of literature about that if, if, if people are interested about, and I noticed that you dropped a Johan Hari quote about connections being the opposite to dependence, which is very, very true. Um, uh, sorry, can you redirect? I just lost my train. Yeah, how useful is it to share your own experiences? Yes, of, of course. With, with um, yeah, look, not very. I think you've got to ask yourself one question, and this is what it's great for all parents and for us to ask ourselves, is when we're going to address something with a young person, whose needs being met? So one of the things I know about young people, you start talking about yourself and they really don't want to hear about your, your walk through 15 feet of snow. And, and the other thing too, is that you may have a very firm and rigid view of thinking that if you do it this way, you're gonna end up the same. 
So again, you know, that idea of sharing experiences, look, it can have a real backlash actually. And if you don't have a really um, good, effective kind of a um, uh, respectful communication with your child, um, and they're already at that point of being rather disrespectful, it can fuel the excuses and you get caught up in that. So the first question I'd ask you to do, the other thing is in, in 25 years of working in the, in the sector, I've never had to disclose to be credible. And I think that's another really, really important thing that disclosure is not a qualification or credibility. And, and it does mean as well that your child may not be actually also ready to hear about some of the things that you experienced as a young person because they're too busy processing their own stuff. So I'm not saying don't because I think it's really awful to say to people, don't do that. Um, because you may have actually done that already. And if parents are listening, they might think, oh no, I've, I've disclosed. It, it's not about that. It's more about what is the purpose of the disclosure I would get them to ask themselves for. Because usually if it's like cannabis, people go, oh, but it was 30 times weaker back then. And that's actually not true. So you're already entering the conversation of lack of credibility because I guess like in research, you know, N doesn't equal one. One person's experience is not going to be another's. So that's how I'd probably encourage people to think about what they want to get out of that conversation as opposed to warning them or scaring them or, yeah. Yes, the intention behind it, you know, is this going to be supportive? Is this going to be helpful? Is this going to be illuminating or, or is it going to be a barrier or a, or, a, or a diversion? Lovely. Thanks, Belinda. Okay, we have a question here which I might direct to Louise and Godley from Good Grief. Um, we mentioned tuning into teens just before a parenting program. Um, can you tell us, are there any other programs on the northern beaches that can help prepare parents for the challenges sometimes in raising teenagers? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I think tuning in to teens is one of the most well-known and most good programs for teenagers. We would actually um, more support professionals in support of the children that they're working with, but definitely when we're talking to professionals, tuning in to kids and tuning into teens comes up quite a lot. I think um, it fits really nicely with the programs that we run because it's very much around that emotion coaching and recognising and um, supporting that acknowledgement of feelings and helping children to work through things. So um, there's lots of programs that go really nicely together, but that would be probably one that um, we would hear people talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Having, um, I'm a bit of a convert for tuning into teens, teens as you ladies know. Um, I think we all are. So, totally emotion coaching um, all the way. So, um, yeah, let's stick with that one definitely. Um, Mike, over to you. So, a question for you, Kerry. Um, how might we uh, separate behaviour that might be a teenager acting in a disrespectful way? versus a teenager who may be struggling with depression and um, that behaviour may be stemming from that experience. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think looking for uh, signs, you know, warning signs of maybe, you know, being socially withdrawn, um, recognising, um, you know, if they've got a continuous drop in moods, um, if there's an increase in alcohol, um, reserved or quiet and not participating in usual activities, um, and maybe staying in bed is a big one, staying in bed longer than usual. I mean, I know teenagers stay in bed, but <laughs> staying in bed, at, you know, longer than usual, maybe. So just to be really wary and, and, and look out for those even small signs. Yeah, and I imagine much like we've been talking about tonight, being able to inquire, ask questions, find out more about what's happening for them, you know, what's behind yeah. that behaviour, whether it's, it's coming across as disrespectful or, or they're seeming withdrawn or not responding to questions, etc. But, but being curious and letting them know you're there, you're available and when they're ready to, to talk. Yeah, I really think, you know, having that conversation is, is really powerful. Yeah, yeah, Asking bringing it into dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Kerry. Thank um, you. The next question we might throw to Belinda. Um, Belinda, um, sadly we have lost um, some young people to suicide on the northern beaches. Um, 
obviously really devastating for family members and the community. Um, the question is, do you see a link uh, between drugs and alcohol and suicide in young people? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. And, and we know that from the evidence as well. And I think that's a really great question because often we'll be talking about um, when people, young people are acting out, particularly when they're using alcohol and other drugs, you can't always notice the behaviour can be really repelling as well. And people can be really um, uh, using to, to obviously manage feelings and those things. We know that in about 50% of completed um, suicides that there has been alcohol or other drugs. It's unfortunately over-represented. One of the things that's really difficult for families though, is when you have somebody who's very distressed and is self-medicating for, for, for a term um, quite heavily, um, they can, that's when it can be really difficult because they can kind of go off and, and be drinking or using at night and, and they may be coming home and they're not necessarily weeping and crying to you and talking about all their problems and they're not even open with you about it. They just go back to either smoking the bowl or drinking or whatever it is that they do. So there is a real link. I think, again, one of the, um, I mean, if everyone did tuning into teens, I'd, I'd love to see a reduction in the presentations, maybe some of that really causal and it's very very complicated if you are worried about some people use drugs and alcohol in a very harming way and in fact you know some of them actually use it in a way that's you could say all drug use is harmful but there could be a difference between when somebody in the face of um, for example alcohol use starts putting themselves in a position not deliberately but just for a variety of reasons they're still drunk and they're always drunk and they're always being picked up and they're being dropped home and people are annoyed with them and they're sick of them. Those sorts of things is not because they're chemically hijacked. We really need to be very curious as, again, what is happening for that person? So that link is really strong. One of the things I encourage people to do, though, is, again, rather than just looking at the person in the, and pathologising the person and pushing that person into treatment, if they are really resistant, they're not going to anchor in treatment. There's no magic card we have with that although we're happy to work with young people who are not necessarily voluntary in that sense of wanting to come in just to even have a talk but again this is probably one of the biggest elephants in the room that we face as a community is the um the the levels of drug and alcohol that contribute to the risk of people completing suicide during intoxication now i, I want to say that in, in a way that that produces potentially more fear for people. So that idea of thinking, oh God, now they're using and it's unpredictable. But, but again, most, most people, um, if they are using at those levels where you actually have a concern, we really ask you to speak out because even if they're not gonna come to treatment and during those times we've been through on the Northern beaches as a community has been very challenging for all of us to bear witness to and to watch, but we do know how to respond and we need people to, if they're not getting the person refuses to come to treatment, you come and speak with us. You come and speak with us and we can show you how to create greater opportunities to help you navigate what has clearly become a difficult time. That's great. Thank you for, for those wise words, Belinda. I um, should also point out we have some amazing services on the Northern Beaches. We're so fortunate. We do have SDEC. Uh, we've heard from Days in one of our previous um, uh, webinars. We've also got Odyssey, Odyssey House in Kadesh, and also family drug support for family members that are really struggling to support someone with drug and alcohol. Um, so, yeah, and I think, I think Kylie um, from Relationships to Australia was quite keen to jump in and perhaps respond as well. Yes, I also wanted to say that um, young people can often get some support from Headspace in Brookvale. Um, I've had families come to me and the young um, teenager may not want to speak in a family setting, but they will speak with the younger counsellors that Headspace provide. They don't want to go to the school counsellor because that's a stigma, but the Headspace kids um, counsellors are in their 20s and 30s and seem to be able to relate well to people between the ages of 12 and 25.
No, good point. Thank you for that reminder. And I would just point out that after today's webinar, every participant will get an email which will list all of the services and links to those services that presented tonight. I'd also encourage anybody watching tonight to perhaps also view the webinar that we did for young people because it also sort of touches on some of the key issues that parents and carers and teachers and mentors might be interested in, in looking for. So thank you to both of you. Yeah, which has prompted me to remind people that if you're supporting someone who's in distress, make sure you're getting the support you need to support Points. them. Very it's often a, a really missed thing, mm. isn't it, Sue? That Absolutely. you know that all the attention is going um, on that person who's really struggling, but that can really Im impact the people who are supporting them. And even if you're working in an organisation or whether it's someone that you um, are supporting personally, it's really important you take care of you as well. Really Absolutely, critical. for sure. So I'm aware we're at our time, we've done our hour, but we've had so many questions put in. I'd love to ask one more question to one of our presenters um, before we look to wrap up tonight. So bear with us a little bit longer if you're willing to stay. So this question I'd love to ask for you, Kerry, is around um, someone submitted. I'll read it directly because it's such a good question. How do I support my teenager through periods of acute struggle when they are not coping? Is it just a matter of staying with them so they don't self-harm? When do I know that escalation to a service is appropriate? Thank you. Um, you can always contact the mental health access line. Um, you don't need to be um, in a crisis to contact them. They're available 24 hours, seven days a week for parents, professionals, young people, for anybody with any concerns that's seeking um, advice or support. You can just call them and ask, you know, uh, for any support and if you need to escalate. Um, I'm sure Northern Beaches Council will include the number, but the number is one 800 11 five one one that's a really good support and maybe just letting the young person know that you are there uh, ccmb work in collaboration and partnership with lifeline um, for a support group for parents with um, family members that have suicide ideation or that have attempted suicide and it's a support group um, that meets on a weekly basis locally to provide various support for for any issues within the family so you know giving you tools and strategies to be able to support the family member so I'm sure those details will also be included um, and I wanted to add Sue sorry you were asking earlier on to um, you know, what, what other supports are available for maybe parents. A really good directory is Way Ahead Directory. They have many um, support programs available as well. But yeah, that, I would highly recommend calling the Mental Health Access Line and finding out about Lounge Chat because, you know, a lot of parents um, and carers, uh, you know, feel that they're on 24-hour suicide watch which is really exhausting for them as well so yeah this support group is really good for them too yeah thanks Carrie so important that that support is put into the system you know the whole family mm. system not just the, the person who's really struggling at the edge thank you so much yeah thank so, you I will thank you all presenters. It's been wonderful. I really appreciated you in the Q&A um, answering so many of those questions. But I'll direct the last question to you, Sue. So if somebody wants to support more or, or help more in this area, what can they do? Um, well, I would um, definitely recommend checking out Council's website and considering d um, signing up for training. We've been funded, as I mentioned, for um, suicide prevention um, skills training and that was through the New South Wales Ministry of Health. We call that the gatekeeper training um, program and we have been uh, funded for the next three years to actually roll out a significant number of training to up to a thousand gatekeepers across the northern beaches. What that will do will hopefully create um, a community that is out there to support others and to really wrap around those that that look like they are at risk and, and do need help. Um, the other thing is that I might just say that um, there is, um, on the 8th of July, there will be a webinar that will be hosted by Wesley Life Force in partnership with Northern Beaches Council. And that is to establish a local suicide prevention network. So that really means that we're bringing the community on board on a local level. Um, 
these local suicide prevention networks exist across the rest of Australia and Wesley often go around and they have federal funding to help that those networks be established. Um, so what we will do is we'll add a link um, to our email that goes out to all participants so everybody can see um, 8th of July, which is the last Wednesday after the end of our next week, so next week's seniors, and then it's the Wednesday after that. And that's the real opportunity to sort of do a little bit more. There's lots of also um, volunteering opportunities across the Northern Beaches, CCMB, Lifeline Northern Beaches. You can perhaps consider being a mentor for young people a huge amount of opportunities so I really would just encourage people to sort of look out there and see what they can what they feel that they can do to contribute. Yeah there's plenty plenty needed right absolutely. now as people struggle with their current situation. So yeah absolutely. Really important. Thanks Sue. Yeah you're welcome. Mm. Well I think we've actually come to the end of our webinar. Um, this was the fifth and the second last webinar in the Safe and Sound Wellbeing series so we hope that you gained a greater understanding of some of the key stresses affecting young people's mental health. Um, we've also hoped that you've got some tips on how to support them, as well as making a connection, obviously, with some of our great services and sports on the Northern Beaches. So check out Council's website, make sure you register for next week's webinar, which will be helping older people to stay connected. I can see a theme definitely with the connection <laughs> thing going on here. So um, please make sure that you share these webinars with your family, with your friends and with your workmates. Um, as I mentioned, I'd encourage you to go online and register for suicide prevention training, which is online at the moment, so we can get back to face-to-face -face training. Um, we really need our community to consider suicide first aid skills as essential as CPR. Um, if you want to join up for the local suicide prevention network, watch out for the email that will come out with the details of that being announced in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I'd like to just say to Kerry, to Louise, Godleave, Kylie, Belinda and of course Mike, a huge thank you for, for your time and your expertise tonight. Um, a big shout out to my colleagues Liz and Jess who behind the scenes have worked very hard in making the webinars happen. And of course the team here at Glen Street Theatre for allowing us to use the venue and give us their technical expertise. Um, so to all of you who logged on today, uh, tonight, thank you so much for your interest in your questions and stay safe and take care. Good night.